Today we're talking all about monetization on YouTube, how you get there, what the ads look like, how much control you have, and at the very end of the video, for those who are interested, I'll talk about how much I've actually earned through my channel over the last nine months as a small creator in the knitting space. Welcome back to my knitting channel. My name is Nadine and you can find me at Your Knitting Bestie on Instagram, Ravelry and here on YouTube. On this channel you can expect to find me talking about my knitting from the perspective of someone who lives in a warmer climate being based here in Brisbane, Australia. So today's video is a little bit different to usual. Uh, I thought I would go through something that I have been so interested in. So the topics are uh, what it's like to become monetized on YouTube, what's required, uh, how the ads work, and how much I've earned from my YouTube channel since I started it. So I've written some notes and I've got some stats here for you, um, but I'm obviously not an expert in YouTube. I'm, I do this as a hobby, uh, so it's just kind of um, what I've put together over the last nine months or so of being on YouTube. And in terms of structure, I thought I'd start with talking about monetization and ads, particularly because I'm so interested to get your views on ads, how many is too many, all of that sort of thing. Uh, and then I'll deal with the actual numbers, um, as in what I've actually earned and the dollar figures and things like that at the end, because I know some people don't like to talk about um, money. Personally, it doesn't bother me. Happy to share. Uh, so if you're interested and you're curious like I was, stick around to the end and we'll t I'll tell you all of the, um, the details there. So I thought I'd start out with how you actually go about getting monetized on YouTube. Uh, because I have to say, <laughs> when I was just watching knitting podcasters on YouTube, which I do a fair bit, I actually didn't realize that you had to apply to be monetized. So you have to apply for something called the YouTube Partnership Program, I think. YPP is the acronym. And to be able to apply, you have to meet certain thresholds. So what is it here? I want to make sure I get it right. You have to have 1,000 subscribers and 4,000 valid watch hours within the last 12 months or 10 million valid public shorts views in the last 90 days, uh, which personally I haven't even attempted <laughs> um, to do shorts because it just seems like a really high number in a really short period of time. I thought that maybe watch hours could be more achievable. Anyway, so they're, they're the criteria that you have to meet before you can apply um, to get into the program. So for me, I started my channel back in February this year, 2024. And so I've been doing it for about nine months now. And I became eligible to apply for the um, partnership program at the start of March. Um, and that was really because that, I think that was after six videos, which I was doing roughly one a week at the start. Um, and I think the reason I crossed that threshold after six videos is because I had a couple videos that just blew up and remain some of my highest watched videos. So one of them was the Sophie scarf video, uh, which I think if you, if you're watching me, you've probably watched that video. <laughs> um, and a couple of my uh, videos. So I think I did a knit flops video, which also did reasonably well. And all of those views, um, hit, made me hit the threshold after the six videos, which was incredible. I had fully expected to be doing this, for years, <laughs> possibly, before reaching those thresholds, uh, which didn't bother me at all because, as I said in one of my introductory videos, I, I'm not really looking to... I didn't start this for profit, uh, basically. I wanted to do this to be able to talk to all of you and find a community that enjoys knitting as much as I do, because uh, it's a little harder to find, I think, here in um, the extremely hot weather. <laughs> in Brisbane. Not that there, there is a community here, but you know what I mean. 
Uh, so I was very pleased to be able to apply at that time and so surprised. Uh, but unfortunately, none of um, the views or watch hours from before you get monetized count, like it's not retrospective. So I didn't earn anything off of my um, highest watched videos, which is, you know, a bit of a shame, but that is just how the cookie crumbles. And it got me into the program, which is what we wanted. The funny thing is, though, that once you become eligible to apply to the partnership program, it is not kind of like a you click a button and then you're in. There is paperwork. <laughs> and I mean, I'm a lawyer, my whole job is paperwork. So I was like, oh, more paperwork at home for my hobby. <laughs> um, but it wasn't it wasn't too bad. I was able to get through it with um, some help from watching some of the YouTube videos on how to fill in the forms and things like that. Uh, but the, I think the biggest holdup was that they actually send you out um, a piece of paper with a code on it and you need to input the code into it before it validates your account and set up your AdSense account and val validate your identity and all of that sort of stuff. So that is probably the bit that took the longest. So I was eligible to apply at the start of March and my first payment came through. Oh yeah, you also have to validate your bank account details. Um, so my first payment came through in May. So six videos to um, be eligible and then about three months um, before first payment came through. So that's um, just a little bit of insight into the background. The main reason I mentioned this whole monetization thing is because even before you're monetized, YouTube will put ads on your videos and it's just that you won't have any control over um, the ads. So for example, my Sophie Scarf video, which was blowing off and I honestly felt like a bit of a celebrity. <laughs> oh, that was blowing up and I was getting all of these comments and some of them were really mad because um, they said there were too many ads. And I was kind of sitting there feeling really guilty, but I had no control over um, the ads on that video. So I just kind of had to be like, sorry, um, I, I can't change that right now. And that was one of the reasons why I really wanted to get monetized because I mm -hmm. heard you could change the number of ads on your videos. So after I was monetized, um, uh, I would switch it on, on my videos. Cause I figured if YouTube is going to put ads on them anyway, <laughs> um, you may as well get whatever slice YouTube says is, you know, appropriate for you. Uh, so I switched it on and then I have to say, I just didn't really have, I didn't have any complaints, uh, from viewers and it wasn't a huge amount of, um, money coming through. So I figured it was maybe fine. And I have to admit, I just didn't look at it properly. Uh, after that point, I would just switch on the monetization when I upload a video and leave it. <laughs> Uh, and it seemed to be fine. And then I got a very kind message from one of you lovely people to my Gmail. And in the nicest possible way, she said, Nadine, your videos have become unwatchable. They're, there's a huge amount of ads on them. Um, and can you please look at it, basically? And I was quite surprised uh, because, yeah, I just hadn't looked at it. And I was so grateful that she'd raised it with me, particularly in such a kind way, um, because I know, you know, it's a, it's an important issue. Um, but even if, if you like the person that you're watching, it might've been difficult to reach out and be like, by the way, this sucks. <laughs> um, but I'm so grateful and she was so kind and lovely. So thank you very much to that person who raised it because I then went and looked at my ads, um, which you can actually do. You can go in and um, there's a box that you can tick or untick that says place mid-roll ads. And if you, um, if you click it on, then there's a button that says review placement. And I had seen on YouTube that um, when I was doing the whole application process, that they say they use this advanced machine learning thing to place ads which balance the user experience or the viewer experience, sorry, versus ads 
and that the ads that were automatically placed were something like two or three times less disruptive to the viewer than ones that were manually placed. So I just kind of thought, okay, cool. <laughs> Let the machines figure out where to put the ads. But I went in and had a look at the last couple of videos that I had posted and it was mortifying how many ads had been just jammed into it. Uh, and I didn't even really, <laughs> I don't even really know why those videos were ones that had so many ads put in. I think it was between maybe eight or 10 ads, like different ad breaks um, over the course of a 20 or 30 minute video, which feels insane. <laughs> like that's worse, worse than watching normal commercial TV. Um, so I actually mentioned it to Michael because my partner, my husband, <laughs> uh, because he was really interested in film and TV and he even studied it before becoming a lawyer. And I said, Michael, um, YouTube's putting like 10 ads in my videos. Uh, like, what do you think? Do you think, like, what, an, what is an appropriate amount to have? And he said, oh my gosh, that's insane. Like, that's way too disruptive. Uh, I would really think it's kind of one, maybe, uh, out of the whole video or, um, you know, far fewer in any event. And I thought, yeah, I think I agree. Like I personally <laughs> would find it so frustrating to watch a video that had, you know, two or three ads in the first five minutes. It's insane. Um, so I very quickly went through and took off pretty much all of the ads on all of my videos. So I think I left it at a maximum of maybe one ad per 10 minutes uh, as a kind of initial cut and then I thought I would see what your views are which I'm very interested in because I make these videos um, for your enjoyment I hope um, and also just to see how it goes but it was really interesting going through all of my videos because some videos had almost none and they were you know medium popular videos I'm, I'm not a huge creator here <laughs> I have a couple videos that went wild and then most of my videos, you know, are reasonably small in comparison. So the ones that were getting, you know, three or 4,000 views, which are pretty good, <laughs> um, they would only have one ad in it. But the ones that were, you know, not doing overly great um, would have just a billion through them. So I'm really curious to know, would you, like, if I were to make a commitment to having I don't know, a certain number of ads per video, between one and three probably, would it make you more likely to watch the videos and enjoy them? Um, or does it not really bother you too much? I'm really curious. I also don't know if YouTube leaves the ads, like if you were to just click the button saying, sure, pop them in and they put them wherever. I don't know if it if that's static or if it adjusts over time. So the, the ones that only had one ad were older videos. So is it the case that when you first upload, YouTube puts in a whole bunch of ads, but then as the content gets older and kind of obsolete and vanishes out of existence, uh, do they change it so that it's only, you know, one ad or two ads based on viewer demand or something like that? I don't know. I also don't know if reducing the number of ads would change the way YouTube, like the algorithm pushes your video, because if YouTube is making less revenue off your video, do they have the same incentive to push it to people? I don't know. <laughs> if you do know, if you're on YouTube as a creator and you know the answer, please let me know. I'm so curious. Um, and if I ever find out, I will publicly let you know. So to figure out then if my one ad to 10 minute ratio was somewhat appropriate, I thought I would do a little bit of research and look at my favorite um, knitting podcasters to see how they deal with ads. So I looked at three, um, all of whom are much more popular than me on YouTube. They have way more 
subscribers. So it's an, I don't think it's an apples to apples comparison, but I figured if their channels are doing really well, um, they're probably the right place to look to see what you guys like uh, in terms of your viewer experience and ads. So I looked at, um, I'll, I'll run through them and let you know what I found. So Bethany from Well Loved Knits, whom I adore, she was probably one of the first ones that I started watching and um, she was like my, my gateway YouTuber. <laughs> um, and then I got super addicted to watching knitting podcasts after that. And she's got a huge amount of subscribers. She's got 124,000. And so the video that I watched in this little roundup was uh, around 30 minutes long. And she started with a little intro and then she went into a bespoke ad. So one that she had filmed herself and presumably gotten paid for from a company before then uh, going into the rest of the video. So her ad was for postnatal vitamins, I think, because she's just had, well, recently <laughs> had her second baby. So she did that ad. And then at about 20, min 20 minutes of 30 minutes, there was one ad break, but that one ad break had four ads before you could skip it, which I don't know if that's something that um, the creator can control or if you just put one ad break, if YouTube just jams a whole bunch in. Uh, in any event, I think maybe that's still better because it's only one disruption to the video. And maybe having a bespoke ad is better because you can just skip past it. If you're watching the video, you don't have that little countdown thing that YouTube does. <laughs> uh, so maybe that's a positive for bespoke ads. Um, so yeah, really curious to hear your views as well. Do you hate it when YouTubers or your knitting podcasters put in a bespoke ad at the start? Does that irritate you um, more or less than a YouTube break? Or are you kind of like, oh, cool, because at least the creator has um, control, I guess, over what they advertise and maybe makes make sure that it's more relevant to you. Let me know. Anyway, so then I looked at Casey from Young Folk Knits, who I also love. <laughs> I particularly love her accent. Listening to her is so much fun. Um, and she's just the sweetest, kindest person, which is really lovely to hear at the end of the day. She is again much uh, larger than me. She's got 33,000 subscribers, way more popular. <laughs> And similarly, she had a bespoke ad at the start. Hers was for Craftsy. And then she had an ad, a single ad break again, at 18 minutes of 27 minutes of her video. And there were three ads before you could skip. So then the final one I looked at as part of this little roundup was Amy from Knee Knits. And she has pretty similar to Casey, so around 30.9 thousand subs. And she started with an ad for Squarespace at the start, which I think really means that she's made it. Squarespace seems like a really good sponsor uh, to have on your channel. So she did her ad for Squarespace and then 14 minutes into a 35 minute video, there was one ad break and again, four ads before you could skip. So there's definitely a strong theme there or a strong trend in terms of what the popular YouTubes do with their ads. And that is to do one ad at the start, which presumably they get paid for. And when we go to the actual money section, you'll see that that's probably more profitable for them because you don't, you don't get paid that much from ad revenue. So if they can get paid something, for that ad at the start, it's probably more than they would get from ad revenue. And because of that, they can afford to only have the one ad break at the end. Oh, well, at around two thirds of the way through their video on average. So really interested. Um, I have had a couple people approach me uh, for ads or things like that in my videos, but it's really hard to tell. <laughs> which ones are legit and I'm a little scared of getting scammed um, by engaging with these people and maybe giving away you know personal information to 
yeah, disingenuous people on the internet, on the internet. So if I were to kind of start looking at doing that, I'm sure it would be an area for me to kind of upskill in and to be pretty savvy on who I talk to, as well as what sort of products I would agree to put on my channel. Uh, Because obviously I wouldn't want to be endorsing junk (laughs) or stuff that is completely irrelevant to the content of this channel. So, for example, I think I got one for an exercise bike once and I was like, I don't don't think I'm the right person (laughs) for that. But yeah, so at the end of this segment, I think the approach I'll take is probably two ad breaks throughout the whole video having thought about it as I've been speaking to you. (laughs) So I think if I, if I were able to get a bespoke one, maybe I would put that in at the start, like all of the, the top end of town and then one ad break at the end. Or if I don't have a sponsor for the video and I think I will continue to be pretty selective about that, then maybe I would have two kind of not in the very start of the video, but towards a third of the way in and then maybe at two thirds of the way in. But yeah, I'd love to know what you think in terms of how many ads is too many for a knitting podcast. Uh, Is it really disruptive to you? How do you like see others doing it? What's your preference? Uh, Please let me know because again, I'm, I'm making this podcast for you guys. The alternative is I guess that I could look at um, maybe doing affiliate links or something like that which I have to say, I just, I've avoided because I prefer to receive some sort of a financial incentive just by nature of you watching the video. I don't really like the idea that you have to spend money, um, for me to get some, something in return. Uh, uh, cause you know, times are tough. Everything's expensive. I don't want, I don't want to be a burden. (laughs) So then onto the money segment. For those of you who are particularly interested or a little bit curious. So on average for the last 28 days, advertisers have paid $26.80 per thousand views on my videos. So apparently that number, the amount that you get paid per thousand views will vary based on a whole bunch of different things. So for example, uh, your niche. So I think maybe tech videos or finance videos or something like that, super highly paid per thousand views. Things like knitting content, (laughs) particularly in, I think, Australia, I think it does vary geographically. So I think particularly in Australia where knitting is getting more popular, I think, but not kind of, it's not AFL or something. Um, It's not super mainstream. I don't think it's a super, super highly paid per thousand views sort of niche, uh, which is fine. So, uh, as I mentioned, I did six videos before I was monetized, including that Sophie scarf video, uh, all up in the last nine months, I've posted 20 videos and that did include that little hiatus while my pregnancy absolutely, um, threw me off. (laughs) So there's a little bit of a gap in there, but 20 videos across nine months. And in total, I've earned $1,383.48. So at the moment, I think that's equating to around between $100 and $150 per month. So I think it's, a, it's, it's certainly an incentive to continue doing these videos. Um, but I think it's fair to say that it's probably like I won't be quitting my day job anytime soon. Uh, to live off of my YouTube ad revenue. And personally for me, it'll even be a little while before I break even on the expenses um, that will the the amounts I've incurred to keep this channel going, which is just things like um, I had to buy, you know, Final Cut Pro, uh, a Canva subscription, a laptop, which is actually capable of editing videos uh, because my old one was yeah, not good enough. <laughs> and then the other thing I got is uh, my microphone. I bought that before I recorded my first video because I really wanted to have good sound for you. When I was watching other videos, that was something that set 
uh, videos apart for me. If they had good picture and good sound, um, it was much more watchable. So anyway, after all of those expenses, I think it's fair to say that, um, yeah, it'll be a little while before I break even, but that's okay. Uh, that's again, it's not, um, it's not the main reason for why I'm doing the channel. So I think that's about everything I've written down anyway on this topic. Uh, I hope you found it interesting. I'm, I found it interesting to actually go through my analytics. I hadn't looked at how much I had earned or how many videos I'd posted or how long I've been on YouTube uh, before. So it was an interesting activity for me as well. Um, if you're interested, I'm more than happy to do a couple more videos of this nature. Um, you know, talking about what I did to set up the channel, um, what it was like, uh, and the kind of back end stuff of running, running <laughs> a very small YouTube channel. Um, yeah, let me know. But otherwise, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, thank you very much for watching. If you liked the video, it would be amazing if you'd give it a thumbs up, maybe even share it with a friend. Uh, and if you haven't subscribed yet, I would be delighted if you would subscribe um, so that you can watch my future videos. So thanks very much guys, and I will see you in the next one.